This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, September 14th, 2014, This Agile Life, Episode 62, Death Rattle. Our sponsor tonight is CodeShip. CodeShip is continuous delivery made simple. Try CodeShip for free. Setup only takes three minutes at CodeShip.io. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today are my co-hosts, Amos King. Hey, John. Good evening. I'm really excited to be here tonight. You are super excited, Amos. You are all jacked up. You're up. You're like uh, hopped up on hops and barley and the uppers and the a, downers. And I've just had a long, quiet day, and it's time to get loud and and just have fun. Too much parental supervision for you, so now you're ready to cut loose for a while. That's right. I got to be appropriate in front of the children. Also with us, Craig Buchek. Hello from Chile, St. Louis. Yeah, what the heck? It was 100 last week. It wasn't it was 100. Like, like 55 now here. I know. I like it. I know. I love the heat. Guys, let's dive right in. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about the health of your Agile project, or maybe more importantly, the health of your agility. As, as a... As we've all experienced from time to times, from time to time, sometimes our agile foo is better than other times. Can you say time one more time? No. (laughs) We have no time for that. (laughs) And sometimes our agility is faltering. Sometimes it's doing great. But... Our question to work tonight and to discuss and to try to provide some answers, at least some discussion around, is what do you do if things aren't working so well? If all the time. <laughs> well, first of all, how do you know? Yeah. First how do you know? Figure out how we know. Is it a gut? Is it a gut sort of feeling? <laughs> so I'd like to say that. It's something that you should talk about in your retrospective. But uh, what happens when you're not even having those anymore? Like, well, you know, you, of, yeah, go ahead. One of the ahead, things Chris. I like to do in a retrospective is the, what I call the happiness metric. Um, and in, I call it a temperature as well. Um, so we have the we do it in two different phases. Actually, we have the personal happiness and how is the team doing? And they're both temperatures uh, from zero to ten. So. 10 meaning I can't imagine doing any better and zero meaning uh, things are falling apart and I should have left yesterday. Um, So that's one of the ways I gauge how the team is doing um, and how individuals are doing. And we track those over time and and graph and um, so we can see sort of um, sort of quantitizing a, a qualitative feeling, which is the best I can figure and, we can do on that. And I've done this with you. We we also do it anonymously, right? Right. Although I I wish I had a tool that would track individuals over time and, you know, see how it, it, it sort of anonymous but tracking individuals. That would be more interesting to me. I, I, I think it would be better to say maybe this person is on a downward trend or an upward trend than this person put a two, you know. Right, that's what I'm trying to get at there with anonymous trends. How you? How would you do that? How would you have it anonymous? I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but how would you be? How would you do that? Like it'd just be like person one, person two, and and somehow they would they would have the ability to self rate, and then you could go back and look. Okay, person one, yeah, but, is well, basically, up, person two, basically the down. tool would have to keep a cookie on and, and I, on, on who they are, but or uh, they log in. I I think that. 
that, that would be fantastic because you could have, let's say you have a team of five and you have three guys on that team that their um, happiness level seems to be increasing. And you have uh, two people on the team that their happiness is going down. And if you look at overall happiness, you may see an uptrend or an even trend and think that everything's kind of okay or at least not changing. But if you could look at individuals, you could see, holy cow, I have these two people that are dropping all the time. Right. And, and you know, it, it wouldn't even have to tell you who they are. It just says, hey, you've got two people dropping. Consider mm-hmm. this. Uh, you could have an instance where everyone's happiness is going up because all of those people hate agile, hate agility, and your project is becoming less and less agile. So happiness may not be the uh, the best way to assess whether or not your agility is working or how you're how you're doing with your agile adoption. I actually had a case where I was taking happiness metrics and people didn't care enough to actually be honest, and so they just pick a random number every week. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, so th- it's it's not a perfect measure, uh, but it's it's one gauge I, I've used as a tool. I've also had people tell me that their happiness was so low for so long that they just started putting like eights, nines, tens all the time because it didn't matter anyway. Right. And they thought that if they made other people in the team feel good, that the team might at least do a little better as a whole. And what is, what is that? What is that an example of? Depression. <laughs> I, think, I don't know. I think it's what are you giving up, I guess. Yeah, I think it's an example of giving up. <clears throat> and maybe that's an indicator in and of itself. Right. That's right. true. But when, when but you it's hard to tell up. when that's happening. It's hard to it's it's hard to tell when people have given up because they're uh cheating or lying on their self right. ratings. Yeah, but I mean, you have a gut feeling, don't you, for your team, for your project, for your your level of agility that that says to you, I feel like there's something wrong. And if everyone around you is um is behaving as if nothing is wrong, <laughs> I would I would say when you get up in the morning or you don't want to get up in the morning <laughs> and go to work on a regular basis. I mean, we all have late nights sometimes and we just don't want to get out of bed. But when the reason you don't want to get out of bed is because of work, then I would say that's a pretty darn good feeling that, Hey, something's going on. I think Amos must know me pretty well or not even realize it, but that's, that's how I know when things are not going well. Um, I get stressed and I don't sleep well and I'm cranky when I wake up. I don't want to wake up. And I have this weird thing where I keep stressing my feet. <laughs> my feet hurt when I wake up. So that, that's an indicator to me that things aren't going well. I catch myself really having to um, do everything I can to not snap at people. Well, there's a difference here between things aren't going well or you're stressed out and, and whether or not agility is working your agile adoption is is taking hold and it is is progressing so we need to differentiate the two in in certain circumstances and maybe in 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 the circumstance that Craig was referring to where his feet were hurting which is quite interesting that he carries his stress in his feet i know it's weird um it it could be that you're just you're just having a rough a rough time a rough a rough go of it right that but at your your agility could be going great there's a difference between your personal feelings of satisfaction and the success of agility. So they may be tied together because you're ag- you both are agile practitioners. Just but just because uh, you're having a rough day or you're having a series of rough days does not necessarily mean that agile is failing. So what are some things that we can try and use as leading indicators that agility is failing on a project? Well, actually, that's why I have the second metric, which is how do you think the team is doing? And, and that helps measure sort of things that are external to myself to, to extract those, those things. Um, beyond that, um, if basically you're, you're losing discipline, it's probably the biggest indicator. Um, 
any, any of the disciplines that Agile teaches, if you start losing those, that's a big indicator. Um, if you stop having retrospectives, if you stop doing TDD. I, um, I would, I would say anytime pairing. they have a, uh, a large number of things that the team has agreed as how they're going to work, whether that be through organically through retros or some kind of formal team, uh, what is that called? Um, like the document of how the teams can act. But anytime you have like a large number of those things quickly starting to fall off where people just stop doing them. The working agreements, right? There you go. That's, that's a good word. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that there's some other things that we should maybe consider as part of a, a health check. So if you're an, if you're a doctor of agility, number of hours you work in a week. Yeah, I mean that sustainable pace. That's uh, that's one of the core tenets, right? Is to work sustainable pace. Um, focus on the software as opposed to various other things: documentation, process. Um, so if if the focus starts to wander away from delivering a quality product towards delivering documentation or delivering a process for the sake of process, those could start to be indicators as well. Have you guys uh, personally or in the past or in in, in the recent history or or have any experience with some leading indicators that started to tip you off that things were going wrong beyond beyond what we've already mentioned here? Um, one of the things probably, I don't, I don't know if it's an indicator or not, but something I've always had difficulty with is, um, decisions get made at a retrospective to, to do something new, try something different and basically an action item and, and it doesn't get done. Okay. Um, We're going too slow. No more testing. Right. I've heard that a lot and watch teams just completely fall apart over the next three or four months while they do that. Right. Sometimes, hopefully sometimes you can come back from, from that decision. I've, I've been on projects where, where someone managerial has come in and said, we're going to suspend testing. That's the only time I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, to Craig's point <clears throat> about an action item that was, that was decided upon by the team in the retrospective and then not executed on. I've seen something where I actually thought you were going to go with that comment, Craig, was to say when when external forces, uh, usually managerial forces, start to uh, start to make recommendations and or mandate behaviors on the team without any participation from the members of the team. That to me is something that I've seen in a number of cases in organizations where I've been, where their agile adoption really started to fail. These directors and managers start to swirl around and they're like, do this, do that. You know, rather than letting the team try to work things out on their own, they swoop in and, and go back to old world methods of, we need a roadmap and a, and a Gantt chart and, a series of inch stones on a, on a Gantt chart. I would say that comes from that. That means that there's less input from the people in the trenches. And when they start having their input taken away or devalued, they lose trust in the system. They lose the want to communicate, um, or motivation, motivation. Um, Every, whenever you, whenever you feel that your opinion no longer means anything, and at one point it did, it kind of just shuts you out. Yeah, I've, I've seen both of those situations where, where you know, we had trouble executing on what we were trying to do, and then management coming in and, and basically poo-pooing the agile principles and, and causing you to knowingly work less efficiently. Well, they don't always realize that. They well, make those decisions but, based on thinking that they're making you more efficient. Right, right. But I say, I know I'm working less efficiently and that, that hurts. And I think you're, you as the person doing the work probably can tell first. I'm not saying that management can't tell, 
but you notice first on whether you are being less efficient or not. Right. So maybe that's when, whenever you start to say, look, I'm being less efficient, it's time to look at, is this an internal issue that I need to take care of? Or is this a team issue and um, systemic to the organization? I have another um, example where I think is a clear indicator that agility is starting to fail. Uh, I've had an experience at a client that will remain nameless where they were having success with agility. They had, uh, they had a handful, a small handful of projects, two or three projects that were executing using Scrum as the foundation, though not necessarily a textbook implementation. I know Amos has given me the yuck face. And Craig's laughing. Hey, but it was working. So hey, I, that's you know, a, and if it works, that's a good start. That at keep least keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. So they are having success. They they then want it to use the S word. They want it to scale. They want it to start scalable to, agile framework. Oh no. Well, they just want it to scale agile to other parts of the department and other parts of the organization. And of course, they didn't know how to do that. They didn't bother to ask anyone how to do that. What they did was they just brought in a handful of directors and said, we want you to scale this agile methodology to other parts of the organization. And when they did that, those directors came in, had no real clue about what they were doing, and started to dismantle the existing agile projects that were successful. So... This was an indicator when they started to dismantle those projects and take people and move them, uh, rearrange things, that your agility is going to start to suffer because they're breaking up you know, a, a team that has a good cadence, that has a rhythm, that's in one of the nice stages of team fundamentals, you know, forming, storming, norming, performing, all of that stuff. If you've got a team that's in norming or performing and and it starts to get ripped apart that's going to affect your team's performance and then of course your ability to execute so significant changes to the structure of a team including adding a bunch of people and and that's where i was going to go next okay because that's a that's a big thing that i've seen where somebody thinks that hey we're going to add we're going to double the size of this team. It's 10 people. We're going to make it 20 in the next three months. And they're just going to kick butt and, and <laughs> that's funny. And double, and, and double their progress. And then they're like, Oh, why is your progress still about the same? Like it doesn't change much. Well, so now we're showing everybody how to do everything or, and we're back to storming. Mm-hmm. And that's then we, we don't like each other. And informing. Yeah. And going through the the cycles that are there sometimes because it takes a while. Sometimes you have to you have to form, storm, reform, storm before you can go on to norming, and of course to performing. But I have a saying that I've been using with with some of my clients regarding scaling, and that that saying is that I say to scale your agility, you need to scale via multiplication and not addition. And then, of course, I have some fancy consultant slides that I show them, and it's a it's a fancy consultant uh, tagline, right, Craig? That that people and with with ties on like to hear. But so 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 continue the with with the metaphor, yeah. Because because I usually think of multiplication as bigger changes in addition, of course. And and the metaphor continues that it's not simply a mathematic thing, but what Amos was talking about, a lot of people's natural reaction to wanting to scale is to add people to a project and or a team. And what I say is, rather than trying to add people to that team, leave that team alone because that team is norming or performing. Now, multiply that team across your organization. Create more small teams to scale. Oh, gotcha. So, so two four-person teams working on a project instead of one eight-person team. Yeah, if you have one four-person team today, don't 
cram more people into that team, right? Because but, but how you do get, you get the ideas from the original performing team to the other teams you want to help perform? Why do you need to do that? Well, they need not, to be. Not everybody too, works the same won't. way. Well, true. But how do we get a new team to move from you know, old methods that aren't working very well to improved agile methods? So my thing is, you know, even if you want to double the size of a team, move in one person. Wait three or four months. Move in one more. Wait three or four months. Take the two of them, break them off at that point to another team, and add a, one person to them. Yeah, Wait but three or four months, add another person. Usually an organization has zero patience for that sort of <laughs> thing. Right, they don't have a year to build that second team. No. Right. So build a brand new team, inject it with uh, the, the same sort of thoughts and, and information that you, you did when you built the first team. Try to recreate, recreate that, that, um, that process that you used for creating that first team. Start with a basic set of, here's how we're going to work today, and through our own retros, not through the other team's retros, we will change how we work. So you have that basic set. And then you can also do things like lunch and learns, where one team talks about, hey, here's how we do this, and we just have lunch with everybody. Right. Before you get to that, though, I think you need to start the new team with, with an agile coach and some agile training just to, to help get them up to speed on, okay, well, how can we be performant? Um, what, what are the things we I, should know to work well as a team together? I think that depends on who you're staffing that team with. Right. If, if they're agile experts and they've worked on several agile teams and, and been successful, then, then they can sort of spread the word. But or you can hire have me and those team. people. Exactly. Yeah, you just hire me, bring in four people. We know we're already performing. Let's do it. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's what I said. Agile coaches, other agile practitioners. Um, I like to think of myself more as an agile practitioner than coach, but that, that's another way to spread the, that the is knowledge. One suggestion, seriously, and I'm not trying to sell myself, is to find a small development team that um, goes around and does work, bring them on, and add a person to their team. And so that you, John, you know, that can get you over that hump of we need this now. And then you can slowly add people to that team and then pull there and slowly cycle them out. Yeah, I've seen a lot of startups work that way. Um, they'll hire someone like Pivotal Labs to, uh, to start on their project. And then so those are basically consultants. And then once they get going and they sort of prove out the concept, they start hiring permanent employees that work with the people at Pivotal Labs, basically in the same office. And they basically build the team and move the Pivotal Labs guys out of the team. And I think that's a very viable way to do those things, if you can't do that already internally. Far too often, though, guys, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely against the theory or the idea of adding people to a team. But far too often... The notion of adding someone to a team is not seriously considered and understood when you, when, you, when you think of the effect that adding that person to that team is going to have. And everyone knows today, and if you don't, call me up and I'll come over and I'll hit you on the head with a tack hammer. <laughs> that, <laughs> that would add, be painful. Yes, that's the idea. <laughs> that adding a person to the team is going to slow the team down regardless of who the person is, regardless of if it's Amos or Craig, for some period of time, the team will slow. Absolutely. Because you have to reset that team back to a forming, storming state, and that person has to get up to speed. And, and the more people you add, the longer it takes to get back up to that. It just freaking boggles my mind. The people <laughs> that have MBAs today... In these organizations, sitting there with thumbs up their asses, thinking that they can just go around and take any person from one team to another, move them in, and it's going to be seamless. They, they think that people are like well, interchangeable. Don't try and talk over me. <laughs> they th I'm on a rant. They okay. think that people are interchangeable, pluggable units of resources. 
that they can just move around at their whim, and I want to punch them all right in the face. But if I okay, add a hold on a second. Of Rant. Power, I have an extra kilowatt. <sighs> Rant over. <laughs> I got to cleanse my aura. Uh, all right, Pe- people work here. Uh, it turns uh, out, uh, not resources. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> God. <And, laughs> that is, yeah. And and what I what I really don't understand is there are books, whole books, written about the subject of adding people to a team in the sixties and seventies, and I'm pretty sure that people knew it in the 1800s that you couldn't just add more people and get more done in certain jobs. Well, it, it's uh, on an assembly line. It's not as big a deal, uh, but in creative work and, and knowledge work, it's, it's a huge deal. Right. And not everybody in the 1800s was on an assembly line, which is why I'm saying I'm assuming some people already <laughs> right. knew this back then. That's true. So we definitely learn as a culture, we learned this lesson at least 40, if not 50, if not 70 years ago, that adding people into an, an, an organism, a team organism, is going to slow them down for some period of time. So I'm not against adding people to a team. I just want everyone to be cognizant of the fact that there's an effect, there's an impact, and it's going to take that team time to ramp back up. So as an indicator that things are starting to or are going to be falling apart. If your organization is shifting people around a lot for the sake of reorg, for the sake Mm of leveling resources, quote unquote resources across the organization, that that could be a leading indicator that your agility is going to suffer. True. Um, well, I just feel like I unburdened myself. Yeah, I, I kind of feel really good after you got that out. You look more comfortable, and you're smiling. I, I'm really happy for you, John. I'm in a zen, <laughs> zen place now. Uh, you know, right along those lines, if, uh, if a company comes to me and they've changed the name of their human resources department to the human department, uh, I, I will give them a discount. <laughs> uh-huh. So... So I worked for a company, a large beer manufacturer, that changed their HR department to people. Yes! Uh, The department was called people, but they still dealt with resources. I was... uh, Uh, (laughs) Well, it was a step in the right direction. You know, uh, progress sometimes takes time. They had a retro, and they saw a problem, and they fixed it. And they just haven't seen the next problem yet. Uh (laughs) But Okay, so... We've got some indicators. Yep. And let's say we're seeing them and things are starting to fall apart. We're starting to feel really unmotivated. What are some things that we can do to try to stay motivated through that? Are there any uh, retrospective exercises built for building back motivation? Uh, I think there are, but I don't have the retrospective handbook in front of me to remember what they would be. Well, a, a retrospective exercise is not necessarily going to inspire motivation just just by the uh the sheer definition of of what you're in a retrospective to accomplish Uh, you would maybe have some exercises that are focused on having the team identify ways to re-inspire themselves and to come up with uh, other ideas for becoming inspired or getting their mojo back. I think that there are actually some activities that are team building activities that can help with motivation. Um, I think any team building activity would actually help with some motivation. Find something where you still feel like your opinion matters. Mm. And, and you can, I think retro is a fantastic place to do that. So if there's an exercise that can give the team something that they can change, if manage, even if management's coming in and saying, you have to do this this way, well, there's other things that you can change. Well, well let's, let's make a distinction here. Let's, let's divide this, or bifurcate, to use a fancy word. <laughs> a $5 oh, word. Thank you. Yeah. That could be a show title. Another $5 word. Let's, <laughs> let's divide this into two camps of agile issues. Let's have one camp being the organization, the management in your organization is dictating new 
processes, rules, etc. Okay, and then the the other camp or the other side of the coin being that agility is failing for no particular reason of management. Um, there's 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 something endemic on the team and things aren't working out well. Uh, and and let, so let's let's address it from those two axes. And I think having you know re-inspiring motivation, et cetera, can deal with deal with the one side of the coin where it, the the team is 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 just faltering. Their agility is faltering. Are there other ideas that we can use uh, to to deal with you know a team unaffected by external forces that's having problems? Uh, I think that. A you know Craig talked about team building exercises. I think it's more than just a retrospective. Um, maybe sometimes it takes a day. Like just take a day and let the team go. I don't know. Play laser tag. Um, <laughs> shoot the boss with paintballs. Uh, have a movie night. Have dinner together. Do things outside of work. Uh, I think that that can be very motivating very refreshing um, or even give them a day to work on whatever they want, whether that be in the project or open source software. Th- those are fantastic too. Mm. Yeah. And then have them show off what they did after they're done. Hey guys, here's an idea. Why not check out our sponsor code ship code ship is so simple to use. You can get your project set up and building on code ship in as little as three minutes. If you're not using CodeShip, then you're spending more time on continuous delivery than necessary. Our good friends at CodeShip won't even ask you for a credit card to get you started. I know, I've done it. What are you waiting for? Maybe you're worried that you'll run into a problem or you'll have trouble getting started. Fear not. If you need help getting started, you'll find all the help you need on the CodeShip blog at blog.codeship.io. Plus, their blog has tons of interesting and helpful posts and videos to help you elevate your continuous delivery. If all else fails, the good people at CodeShip are easy to reach, and they are always happy to help. Few things in life are easy, but this is one of them. Let CodeShip make continuous delivery simple for you. Go and visit codeship.io slash thisagilelife and use the offer code this Agile Life when you sign up and you'll receive a 20% discount for three months on any paid plan. Thanks to CodeShip for sponsoring This Agile Life. And now back to our discussion. I think the best people to solve this problem are, of course, the people on the team. And what I have done in the past is propose a little bit of a reset or a reboot, call it what you will. Um, a time, a period of time for the team to get off of of the of, of the hamster wheel for a second, to step aside from the day to day operation of the team, and to spend a day, two days, three days, maybe even, God forbid, a whole week, thinking about what it is that they're doing, how they're going about doing that, and and just having a a period of time where you're kind of going about retooling your entire setup. If, if people are having trouble, if you're, if you're not being successful, if you have stories that are, are not getting completed, if you have stories that are rolling over, um, your sprint boundaries or iteration boundaries, then I think it's really time to think about spending some more time, Spending a significant amount of time resetting this, your setup, resetting your process. Have you guys ever had that experience where you've been part of a team that was having problems and then were given the opportunity to kind of reboot things? Um, it's been a while, but yes, uh, I, I was on a team and, and we went out and this is where I got the laser tag idea. We went out and played laser tag and then we had uh, a dinner like the next week and, and the Monday of that next week when we had dinner was also just like play day. We did whatever we wanted at work. And that's good for morale, but it, it solves nothing. 
<laughs> I, I, I don't I don't know. I, I don't I would say that it it solves a lot because when you go do those things, you talk with your team. It really does turn into a retrospective, whether you're going to lunch together as a team or out to dinner or you're shooting each other in the back with paintballs. There, there's something therapeutic that comes out and people start to talk whenever they're outside of that normal setting and possibly whenever there's there's no other ears in shot that team starts to talk and and get to know each other and it can have a huge impact and things talked about on what we should change it really is just a different way to have a retrospective so i think if morale is one of the problems then helping morale with a with an exercise or a day or some activity like that is definitely helpful um and, and I if think, Tice was here, he would say the whole team should do yoga every morning as their exercise. <laughs> and, and I think if you have problems, I think morale tends to become a problem. So, so I think it's probably effective in a lot of situations. That might be that might be the first step in in your recovery. Start with morale. Start with improving morale. Get everybody Good way to get people to talk. Yeah, get everybody a little bit looser happier so that so that they're they're more willing and accepting of of additional critique feedback and then ready to think about making things better for for agile so i've never seen a reset you know that was called a reset really um except when you change the makeup of the team and so i'm going to propose if you're really having serious problems and i know that you know adding people to your team can cause problems but it can also be that reset point that might help a struggling team. Swap a person out. Or, or a couple. I mean, if the team's really having trouble, then um, I, if, they're, I, if they're really at a low point, then you're probably not going to go too much lower, so you might as well reorganize. And I, th- I think that depends on where your team is and what's going on. If your team's been together for two years on the same project, maybe... A couple of them are a little burnt out. They're tired of doing accounting software. They're like, oh, <laughs> man, I just want to do a social networking site because, you know, that's the next thing. <laughs> and and so y- y- if you move one or two of them, it can be a nice, refreshing thing. I, I completely agree with that, Craig. Pretty awesome. I've been uh, I've been in organizations where We've we've suggested the reset. We've suggested the reboot. And it's funny, Craig, because oftentimes all of the managers swarm around and they say, "Oh my God, we 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 can't say the word reset. We we can't say the word reboot because um, you know then then the directors and the and the VPs will get the the sense that things are failing. It's like who gives a shit if we call it a reset? Call it what it is. Give everyone a chance." to shift into a different lower gear and and reset things otherwise you're going to continue you know at 100 miles an hour down some rat hole that ends up in a disastrous ending which in a lot of cases results in a significant turnover on that team and a lot of times when you get down into the bottom of that rat hole it turns into people losing jobs so, so basically, if basically, yeah, so basically, if you don't reset in some way, which may be moving people around, people are going to move around anyway on their own. Right. Speak with your feet. So, speaking <laughs> of that, how do you know when it's time? How do you know when to, to give up on your team? Or, well, I guess there's two points to that question. One is, how do you give up on it? No one to give up on a team, and how do you know when it's time for you yourself to move on? I think if your feet are hurting, that that's a really bad <laughs> sign. <laughs> In there, if my feet hurt, I, I've ex- had the experience personally where you sit up in bed, you're not tired, you're not necessarily tired, or you're just as tired as you ever are, right? But it has nothing to do with how well you slept. It has everything to do with the notion and the thought of you dragging yourself from your bed through your morning routine, through your morning commute and into that office. 
and and if you have if you have a series of days or a string of weeks where you have days where you feel like you just can't get yourself out of bed or you don't want to get out of bed, you don't want to go into that office, I think that you should stop. You should stop going in or be extremely transparent with your team. Dissatisfaction. And, yeah. I mean, be, be extremely transparent with everyone and say, you know, hey, boss, um, for the past three Mondays, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've had to get my wife to drag me out to the car every morning because, or my significant other, or SO as I've seen it abbreviated. Get my significant other to drag me out to the car because I can hardly bear to come in here. We need to make some changes. Or I'm going to make a change that's going to be leaving. I think you, I, 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 I don't think there's anything to lose with that level of transparency. If things are that, if things are that bad, if you're already thinking about leaving, if you're already having trouble making it into the office. I, I had a job where I was having that problem and I became pretty transparent about it and it didn't start really to change. And then I started looking for a new job. And I think that that's another way that can boost where you are. Sometimes just talking to other places and seeing that maybe the grass isn't always greener um, can, can help re-motivate you. Because sometimes you're just in a slump. And also, when you find out what someone else is willing to offer you, it gives you a good place to go back to your team and feel more confident in saying, here's, here's how we need change. Here's what I think we need to do. And I need it to happen soon. And you don't have to tell them that you're getting other offers, but you know, it gives you that the gusto to come in and say something because you realize that, Hey, other people think I'm, I'm worth something. And it kind of can get away from that demotivating feeling and allow you to try to change. And that's what I did. I went and interviewed at like 10 places and felt really good about myself, which gave me the confidence to come in at work and say, Hey, look, we need to make these changes. And those changes happened after that. And I think a lot of it was because instead of beforehand, I was saying it, but it was like, Oh, we need to make these changes. My life sucks. I came in at it with a more confident outlook on it. And I think that was perceived by the rest of the team of, Hey, he's confident about this change. A great story. I want to uh, I want to offer one one piece of information that I that I've exp- that I've noticed and experienced over my years in the industry, and I actually call this the death rattle. Um, the reason I call it the death rattle is because there's there's an actual medical term known as as the death rattle, and it's something that happens to people when they're they're nearing death. There's a certain sort of breathing. Uh, noise that sounds like a rattle that starts to occur. So it's an indicator that someone's going to pass away. And when a person goes from being um, morose and depressed on a team to all of a sudden happy, I call that the death rattle. I say, I tell people, I say, watch out because that guy was really, really unhappy he was really acting depressed, and all of a sudden, he's happy. I said, that means he's probably about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, uh, Amos, I think that I understand what you're saying. You, wanted, you, you, got some, you got your emotions propped up by talking to some other people and then them telling you, you have self-worth you're valuable, you're smart. And then that inspired you to go back and make changes. And th- I think it also inspired you because you knew that there were, there was other grass out there that was green. Yeah, I didn't, I, I knew that if it didn't work, I had an option. I had an out, mm-hmm. which gave me a lot of confidence. And, and yeah, uh, sometimes just knowing that someone else wants you can give you the, the motivation you need to 
make positive impact on everyone else in your team? So I, I would say in some ways, if you hate your job, if you're in that situation, that, that you're basically depressed. And you should probably treat that like any other kind of depression and get some sort of help for it. And we should probably have a whole episode on depression. Uh, there's people in our communities that, that talk about depression among programmers. Um, and put that as a topic in our backlog. I, I, I agree. And, you know, one depressed person can bring the rest of the team down. <laughs> and one super motivated person can bring the rest of the team up. You're not talking strictly about, Craig, clinical depression, right? You're talking about a, a bout of, of depression. It's still clinical depression. It doesn't matter if it's chemically induced or situationally induced. Okay. I don't want to have to get the DSM-5 out or anything. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, th I think that there's some differences, right? Because there's people that are clinically depressed that um, has nothing to do with the situation. They can't help it. They, they're, they, have, they have a condition. And then there's people that are just unhappy. There's just people that are unhappy and depressed because because of a set of circumstances. Right, but they're both treatable by similar means. Well, no, they're not, because the person that has a condition, you're not going to be able to simply treat them by making their life better at work. True, true. So that's where I was trying to draw the distinction. No, no I mean, I've We had, digress. I've one, had, one, I've one had depression from a situation before. And, and it sometimes does require some medication. Uh, whereas if you're depressed just from brain chemicals, you're probably going to always need medication. Yeah, right. It's, it's a difference between having like depressive disorder and depression. A, I guess, and a, I don't bout, know. <laughs> a, bout, a bout of depression. That's right. Versus the long-term I'm going i'm going three rounds with depression or 10 we are not doctors <laughs> we are not doctors and we are not providing uh doctor level advice on how to deal with your <laughs> your bout of depression and or clinical depression so please please seek medical medical help if you are experiencing depression i will say drinking heavily will not help you in either case yeah alcohol is a depressant <laughs> yes let's use a depressant to treat depression so yeah, let, let's let's go let's get this back on on track a little bit and talk about it, it, it's time to leave. Uh, you've you've done everything you can, right? We'll assume that you've you've done the yeoman's work to try to work things out, and it, it's been some time now, and, and you've made the difficult decision, uh, or, or you're at the point where you need you're at the point where you need to make the decision as to whether to leave or not. How do we go about doing that in a way that is appropriate and professional burn all your bridges oh, oh god no don't do that get a, um, get a box of matches oh, no not literally burn anything one by one go to each person mm. and 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 light the match mm. the, the the metaphorical match oh. i've seen that happen i'm gonna get a real match and just walk yeah. in boss's office this and light metaphor. it and hold it up I'm, and just just blow it out and be like you smell that that's how i feel about this job it's time for me to go. <laughs> build a bridge, build a bridge, a model bridge out of wood, and take a match to it. All the while, while you have a boombox on your shoulder that's blaring, "Take this job and shove it." Thank you, David Allen Co. for writing that, and Johnny Paycheck for making it famous. Anyway, sorry, digression to music. <laughs> Everybody looked at me like, "How do you know that?" <laughs> <laughs> what a great last name. <laughs> you are from uh, a, a rural county in Missouri, so I'm not surprised. Wait, I live there now. That's not where I'm from. From a rural county in Illinois, and, and and I lived in Los Angeles. I'm I'm all right. I've been all over. Um. <laughs> so what do you do? You need to make the decision about leaving. You need to make the decision, or you already have. Yeah, you're in the midst of making the decision, and sometimes someone will make it for you when you're ready to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Uh, if you are that down and out about your job, a lot of times somebody else will notice. And sometimes a manager will, uh, instead of choosing to try to talk to you about it, will choose to just let you go. <laughs> that uh, you think is that bird is that bridge burning when that happens? Is that a burnt I, bridge? I, 
I think you've already burnt it. I think anytime you get let go, unless it's because, you know, we just lost a $3 million customer and we can't afford to pay you anymore. If it's not that, um, yeah, th- then yeah, you've burnt a bridge. That's damaging. It's, too, it's late. So you should make sure that as you're, as you're in this situation, that you're trying to protect against burning that bridge because you never know what's going to happen in the future, right? I mean, my father told me that from the time I was 16 years old and had my first job wrangling shopping carts at the local supermarket. You know, don't burn bridges. I'm like, Dad, I'm at a supermarket, you know. You never know, son. You could work with that guy again one day. So, and so if- have you? Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, just because you're having a bad time with everybody at work now, you've probably had at least one good time with somebody there. And you don't want to leave with them not liking you either. Yeah, and, and things could change at that company. I mean, they could they could turn things around and it could become another, you know, you could want to go back there at some future point and maybe you'd have to work with some of those people again. So if you're getting, if it's becoming that bad, don't let yourself, my suggestion is don't let yourself get fired. You know, get get out of there before it gets to that level. I think when you... <laughs> So you, you've gotten to that level and you're leaving. You need to do it professionally. And I really suggest not walking in and saying, here's my two weeks. Like, write a letter. A letter of resignation. We're professionals. We should write a letter of resignation. And tell them in that letter why. But make sure you do it in a way that is constructive, not demeaning. And maybe if there's a hundred reasons... Pick one or two that are your top ones. Don't destroy them. And then also tell them something good that you had while working there. And let someone else read it before you go give it to the CTO or whoever you need to turn it into. Like like someone who doesn't work there, like your spouse. I think that's a solid suggestion. I would also recommend that after you've written that, that you should not write it and immediately hand hand it in. You should write, write it. Take it home, sleep on it, read it again, and decide if you... And then you can let somebody else, of course, read it in that same time. But before you get to the point, Amos, where you're ready to do the resignation, I think that you need to be transparent with the project and the organization that this is imminent. So before you... I don't think it should be a surprise to your boss that you're unhappy. Because oftentimes people go and walk into the boss's office with their well-written letter and they say, I'm unhappy. I found another job. I'm giving you my two weeks notice. It's been nice working with you. See you guys later. Right. And then your boss reacts like, well, wait, I, I didn't even know you were unhappy. So you don't, you never want the situation. You never want that situation where the boss says, I didn't even know you were unhappy. You need to make it eminently clear that you're unhappy and you should do that by providing some clear transparent feedback to them that I'm unhappy but here's don't just go and don't just go in there and say I'm unhappy because those are those are the kind of problem children that get fired and watch out for the ultimatum yeah no ultimatums right you're saying things aren't so good here i think if we did x y and z things could be better and I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm not trying to be a problem for you. I'm just trying to recommend that there's ways that we could do things better and I could be happier as, at the same time. That I think we can do X, Y, Z, I think is the most important part of that conversation. Oh, definitely. Most come definitely. in, come in with at least a suggestion of a solution, even if it's not perfect. And maybe that gives them an idea for something even better. But that starts a conversation. That's the minimum that I think you owe in that conversation is a, is a set of suggestions. Nobody wants a problem employee that is just constantly in there saying, you know, the water in the water cooler is not cold enough and the so-and-so keeps forgetting to flush the toilet and, and the break room is always a mess, right? So you need to go in there with some set of um, suggestions for improving your work, your working environment and not just a set of complaints 
And, and you know what? Even in your exit letter, even after you are resigning, if you have some suggestions, add it in that letter. It's not a bad thing to leave with still trying to improve the organization that you were in. I think if you followed all of these steps, if you've started with transparency with your boss, if you've taken uh, our advice of providing this constructive feedback and then being very crisp and formal in your, in your resignation by pro- providing this letter and, and by also you know providing information that you're like, I've enjoyed working here. I think that this is a great place to work and could be better if these things, you know, if you made, if you made these sort of improvements. I think that's a, a, a nice set of circumstances to part ways on. And that's a way to, to not burn your bridge, but to get yourself out of that job. Well, guys, that's all we have time for for our discussion topic this tonight. This week's hottest picks. My pick is something that uh, I'm seeing more and more of. So a friend of mine at work, he showed up one day with this what looked like a, like a half necklace on. And what it was was this thing called the LG Tone HBS 730, which I think LG is discontinuing now. But it's a Bluetooth headset uh, that sits around your collarbone in the back of your neck and has a couple of detachable earbuds that you pull out and then plug into your ears. Uh, It's very comfortable. You can wear it all day. Holds a nice charge. And I use it for when I'm exercising, when I'm riding my bicycle or jogging and listening to podcasts and, and just... Even if I'm just like unloading the dishwasher or straightening up the house, you know, it's a great way to use, uh, listen to your music or to your podcasts. I, I never was a fan of the Apple earbuds because they just didn't fit my ear right and they always were falling out of my ears. And, uh, and other, other earbud type things, our ear, earphones, earplugs would, you know, they had a cord on it. And if you're doing some sort of activity like bike riding or jogging, you could very easily get the cord snagged on something and then yank the yank the little earbuds out of your ears and that causes a problem. So if you like Bluetooth headsets, I highly recommend the LG Tone. All right, Craig, what's your pick? That sounds pretty cool. I don't really like Bluetooth headsets, but that one might actually be accessible. Um, my pick today is a uh an article I came across recently called Storing Passwords Securely um, talks about all the things you need to do and explains them, including hashing, salting, stretching, and rate limiting. And uh, it sh- tells you the three options you should use, which are not MD5 or SH- SHA. They are PBA- PBKDF2, Bcrypt, and Scrypt. So it basically tells you how to do it right. Uh, And a similar article that that reminded me of was uh, an article called Falsehoods Programmers Believe About Names. And it's a bunch of things to make you think about, uh, to to consider when setting up a name field. Hmm, I'm going to have to look into that. Thanks for those picks, Craig. Amos, what do you have for us? So I only have one pick, and I actually heard about this from Jason Tice, so not everything that comes out of his mouth do I completely dislike. Um, <laughs> it's called Lean Canvas, uh, and I can't think of the name of the guy, but we're, we're going to put a link in to a PDF about what Lean Canvas is, which is just like a business plan on one page, uh, almost like a way to organize your thoughts. Uh, I started looking at it the other day. I had an idea for something, and I started to write it out on Lean Canvas, at which point I realized that I just really wanted to remake High Rise. Um, so instead I'm probably just going to sign up for high rise, (laughs) but, uh, it was, it was really nice exercise to go through. And I think it would be a great idea for anybody out there. Who's, who's got a product idea, um, or maybe even use it for an, I, for deciding between ideas that you might pitch to your team. Was this kind of a a mind mapping exercise, Amos? Kind of. It's supposed to be like a a one page business plan is what it's really supposed to be. Um, got an area for problem solution some metrics uh what is your unique value uh what advantage do you have who are your customers um 
how are you going to get it out to the world? What's what's the cost structure of it? And what are your revenue streams in it? So it's it's kind of a more focused thing than a mind map. It's very grid drawn out. Um, I would say each one of the little areas in it, filling it in with a mind map would be a fantastic way to fill it in. Okay. Well, guys, great picks. Great discussion tonight. Thanks for... Thanks for your time. Thanks for participating. And of course, thanks to all of our listeners out there. That's all we have time for today. Check out thisagilelife.com for these show notes and for all of our past episodes. Thanks for listening and keep living this, this agile, agile life. life is brought to you by a community of agile developers and coaches <laughs> aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.